I'm, I was born in Poland. I came here when I was 10 and I lived in Toronto all my life. You lived in Toronto? What year did you come here, Max? 46. 48, sorry about oh, so that. So you come here in 48? Yes. Well, what, what was the community? T t take, take, take us back to 48. 48 is a big year, you know? All things are happening in 48. Israel is established in 48. What's it like when you, what do you remember about Hamilton? You come to Hamilton, what, what? It's a beautiful place. It still is up to a point. People are walking down the street on King Street. If you didn't come down by 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, you couldn't walk by. Really? We had the chicken roost. Wonderful people came, Goyim, black, Yiddish, Chinese. The world was safe. It was wonderful. But the Bet Jacob Synagogue, all the synagogue was strong. They cared for the synagogue. Everything occurred around the synagogue. The dancing, the plays, the, the, the know-how, the not the know-how. Everything was surrounded by, it was just wonderful. It was a beautiful community. Really? I mean, it was great. <clears throat> And everything was around the synagogues, right? Mostly around the synagogues, and, yeah. And, I, and we, had, we had dancing at homes. We went to dan Yom Kippur dancing. After Yom Kippur, we had a big dance at the Beth Jacob, or, and then they went to Royal, Royal Canaan. But all the synagogues took a part of it. Really? It was where, just where, one. Where was the Beth Jacob in those days? Down on, on, on Eustace Street, I believe it is, a small place. Really? Yeah, Eustace now, Street. Now, this, this chicken was, starts when? In 48. October the 1st, 48, yeah. I had it for 39 years. Well, I remember the chicken roast when I came to Hamilton in 72. It was still there in 72. Oh, yes, yes. Right? Now, Hamilton is an interesting community because you were mentioning a moment ago about Roald Blatt, who had a black driver. Remember you were Walter. Walter, the black driver. In 48, 49, this was a community where, for example, Jews couldn't live in Westdale. That's maybe, right. Maybe, maybe they could by 49. They could or they couldn't? It was very interesting. When I bought this house, going back 40 years ago, Joe Sweet, he was a judge, he wouldn't let me buy the house because in the, in the, in the papers around the city hall, no Jews allowed. Right. I wanted to buy land at Mayfair Crescent, and they wouldn't allow any Jews to buy land there. Really? And we did not. Those years, yeah. But I bought it anyhow. I says, Joe, what can be wrong? Everybody's living on the street. They won't throw me off. And I bought it, and thank God I did. But Joe Sweet was the guy, type of a fellow that if you didn't have the right pen, he, he couldn't sign the lease. Yeah, and the pen had to be the right one. It couldn't be a 99-cent pen. But in 48, 49, there, 1950, there are blacks who are living in Hamilton. Did they come into the chicken room? Oh yes, oh yes, everybody came in, but they were nice people. We never knew about killings, and we sent our, we could, we sent, they sent their kids downtown by themselves. They, there was no, there was no security, there was nothing, it was, they were wonderful people. They still are, you know, but blacks, Chinese, everyone not, came. Everyone came in the front door, they were more than welcome. They were just wonderful people. I didn't know anything about stress till I came to Canada. What's stress? Stressed me. You, you, my, I used to get sick in Poland or here. My mother says, okay, go and get the bankers, go and get garlic with black bread and you'll get better. And I did. <laughs> in my mind, I guess, you know. But there was no stress. What stress? You had to go to work, you had to come home. You, you, you stay with the family. You, you, you wore your underwear, sit out in the balconies those years, you know. <laughs> it was wonderful. Everybody was together. Aside from uh, Westdale, do you, do you remember other instances of anti-Semitism. Was there anti-Semitism in, in Hamilton? There always is and there always will be certain people. I never mixed with those people. I never knew of like today, everybody, you know, who, who loves the Jews? No one. Right. But I, I hung around with nice people that I never found out. I never found that anti-Semitism was used. They were. I did not know them. Right. When, a, when a person says, Jews are my best friend, then I knew he was under the Semit. <laughs> But other than that, no, I, I didn't find In your find catering it. business, Max, did you have a lot of Gentile clients? Mostly Gentiles. I went to the end. I thought, I felt that if I'm going to go into catering, I want to make some money. I'm not going to give up my weekends for 20 or 30 cents. So I took courses in Europe and all over, and I came back, I came back ready. I had beautiful, 
I had beautiful silver plates that no one had, and I had beautiful information that no one had. I went to seminars in Europe and England and all over. So when I came back, I knew that I was going to go for it. And I had most, I had the greatest, like when the FASCO, the President Sherman, those years, I did this wedding. Really? I mean, you know, I, they all chose me. All the presidents, next presidents from the, the FASCO, Stelco, they all called me. They all called me, every one of them. And I did a job, I delivered. I charged, but I delivered. But at the end, I was cheap. Because when I said, I'm going to give you raspberries, you got raspberries. And when you're doing a catering business, you're in my hands, I'm not in yours. How do you know how many dirhams I'm going to give you? And the size of shrimp, or the size of a lobster, or the size of, or how many? I mean, how many wages am I going to give you? Who are you going to count? You know, the shrimps were not every minute, not every 20 minutes. You know, I didn't use the shrimps for, to go to the back door. Don't give them to everybody. The, 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 all the, 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 the there's flu out, flown all, all the time. It was lots. And that, that's why, don't cheat the people. Don't think that you're smart. I always took the attitude that they are smarter than me. So I never got, I never got, uh, I never got disappointed. When I speak to you, I take the attitude, you're smarter than me. I might be smarter than you, but on the other hand, this is the way I think. You don't want to get the phone? No. I remember the catering business. I remember that, that you, you had a very, very good reputation. We delivered. That's all I can tell you. I, if I couldn't buy the best, I just wouldn't serve. Period. I just wouldn't serve. I just wouldn't do it. And uh, I tell you, I go back to the gold bless because they, uh, without them, I just wouldn't be here. Frank Ober, especially George and all those people. Morley uh, was a different person. Who's but George? The, George was Frank's brother. Oh. He's a partner with the Nermitko and all those people. But they were all good to me, and I was good to them. Let me just tell you a little story, maybe you're not here. Yeah, sure. When the chicken loose came in, they came in after shoe. The Goldbergs never carried money on a Shabbos. No? Never carried money. I didn't know that. They come in, and Frank Ola tells me, uh, well, I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? We don't carry money on a Shabbos. Later on, maybe they did. I don't know. I said, so don't worry about it. And for 30 some odd years, they came in every Shabbos, Morley, Frank, and they brought their friends in, the numerous from St. Catharines. I never charged them a nickel for that lunch. Never, never, never. Never! It was my honor and pleasure to do it. We had a little room in the back of the chicken roost. Maxime, uh, Chuck Matchin was telling us the other day that you used to hold an, uh, every year for all the merchants on King Street a big dinner. I did, because I, I appreciate their business, and uh, I called them in, but it was very hard to do those things. I didn't want them to get out there. I didn't invite you, and I didn't invite him, and I invited him, so you had to keep it quiet. So what I did is I picked up checks as I went along for certain people. I didn't want no headlines, you know. Can you talk about what King Street was like in those days? Oh, tremendous. Loaded and loaded and loaded. Different people. You couldn't walk. You could not walk on King Street, period. Really? Jammed. Not busy, jam, jam, jam. Listen, I opened, I went through James Street and uh, there was a place called Kaplan was his name. More, uh, it was, uh, his, his son-in-law was uh, Deloitte, what's his name? Uh, uh, he's on York Street, uh, Al Foreman. And his father ran a restaurant with him, a silver something. And I saw the location, I said, I, didn't, I don't believe it. He didn't do any business. I went in there on a Saturday, I says, Mr. Kaplan, I'd like to buy your place. He says, how much? I said, whatever you want. He said, I want 10000 I said, you got it. And I opened up the first Jet restaurant, open kitchen there. And I did very, very well. Jam, jam, jam. We had everybody coming in. But the most important thing is when you're in the restaurant business, don't fool the people. Give them what they want, and if you can't give them, admit it, and you can't go wrong. Deliver. In those days, they, they didn't have any computers, but I delivered. I've learned one thing when I went to Europe, deliver. It was supposed to be 10 ounces, give them 11, don't give them 9. And admit what you don't know and you can't go wrong. And buy the best. Maxie, going back to the social scene, when you were talking about the heyday and the dances and the social scene, can you just, talk, can you paint a picture of the Jewish community in those days on a social level? Well, yeah, we used to invite people here, we used to go to their houses, we went to the shul again, we went all over. It was close. We knew one another. Today, you don't know anybody. The kids really? don't know me, and I don't know them. Were the synagogue, like, the people from the Addis, were they friendly with people from Beth Jacob? Not all the time. There was always a wall there. Mr. Katz, the senior citizen, <laughs> one of the seniors. 
They hated the Bet Jacob, and the Bet Jacob hated them. But I'll tell you one thing, when Rabbi Green came to town, different look. He says, we need, we need each other. Let's get together. We need each other. And at that time, I think they had an understanding that a member can't quit here and come to the Yardas unless he paid up his dues and all that. Oh. He never paid up. And I, th I don't know if it stands this way. It was a wonderful community. Everybody knew one another. We called up and we went to houses. We went to dancing together. We, we rubbed shoulders together. It was lots of people. Today, you know, my grandson worked with me in the catering for a year. He was very good. Very good. I says, I says John, stay with me. For five years, I'll make you a millionaire. I had a big business. He was working. He went once to Toronto. And he came back and said, Grandpa, I don't want to be a millionaire. I don't want to be in jail. I'm moving to Toronto. There was nothing here for the kids. At one time, Goldberg says, uh, Mar uh, Marvin, you're coming to business with me. Fine, no questions asked. Today, why should I go into business with you? I got my own. I want to go to Toronto. They want to do their own thing. Different world. And it's rightly so. Young, young legs, young people, young different thinkers. So the community has changed. Oh, it changed completely, completely. There's not too many people here. Who's left? The people that are left my age can't walk, can't talk, <laughs> can't see. You know? There aren't as many younger people. Oh, no, no. Yeah. They're going to Toronto. No, they're all in yeah. Toronto. There's not, what is there here for them? At one time you had a business, stay with my business, that's fine. But they, they don't, they, there's no, you know, there's no, no future here. I mean, I'm not knocking Hamilton, Hamilton's my life. I love it here, I wouldn't move from here. We had a, my wife wanted to move. I said, I'm not moving. I said, anyhow, we got an apartment in Toronto, we used, to, we used, to, used, used it weekends. And that's all, after a while, I said, Samet, the people here, they outgrew us. They belong to clubs, $100,000 clubs. What do, I, what do I want? That's not my life. Here, I walked down King Street, everybody says hello to me. I walked in Toronto, everybody says, who are you? In fact, I say, I say hello to them, to just have a talk with them. <laughs> it's a different world. So you can go down to King Street and people still remember you? Oh, God, no, every minute. Really? Chicken, every minute. I was good to the community, the community was better to me. But I was kind, I didn't, I didn't abuse people. I respect the people. I, you have no respect, you've got nothing. My mother says, you have respect first, then you have love. Love is nothing. You respect first, love comes. Oh, every, every minute. The ch and the chicken was mentioned every day, every day with me, every day. Maxie, was it always the case that kids growing up in Hamilton would leave home? Like, they, they would go to university and they would never come back? Those days, they did come back. People had no money to give them for, 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 for different places to live. They had to come back. So they had no money. A lot of people had no money. Those I remember that distinctly. You come home at the night, you go back to school in the next day or in the daytime or whatever. And then they had mothers and cousins maybe that lived together. It was you know, I remember when I had no... I remember my days. And it was also because of the economy. Like you think about the big family businesses and the, the children would go into the family business maybe. And then what happened? Like is it because the economy kind of shifted and it's more into the professions now? People have more education. Much more education. You better, when they talk to you or you talk to the kid, you better know what you're talking about. They'll make, they'll make mincemeat out of you. Listen, I take a computer course. And I'm working on a computer now. My kids, it's a grandpa, grand, come on up. I didn't know how to put on a, I didn't know how to put on a switch to a computer. And I was 79 at the time. I said, Sam, we got to take a course. And we went out to take a course at Mohawk for three months. And then we hired a teacher to come in here in my house and I bought a computer and I'm working at it. You better, today's computer day is a different world entirely. I'm not saying anything that you don't know about. You know more than this. It's a different, and you better admit this a different world. You didn't have many computers at the chicken. No, house, did no. You? And who wanted computers? I mean, computers. There was no computer. The world. When a fella told me the green peppers come from California, thank you for telling me. It was a lot of bullshit. Today, they come from California. Yeah, really. Computer, boom, boom, boom. Where do they come from? They don't come from California. They come from uh, Chicago or something. It's a, you know that. It's a different world today, and you better admit it's a different world, and you better face it. Do you remember in '48 when Israel was established? Oh, sure. Was that a big deal here? Sure. Oh, it was, I did not know too much about Israel. I'm telling you the truth. My father and mother never went into it. They were Orthodox people. But sure, for me, it was the great holiday, the great thing. Uh, uh, we have a country where we, we, the flags were raised. It was beautiful. We give me, it gave me a lot of uh, backup. When I went down, I've got a country. And I, and I was proud of it. 
Uh, you, you were a member of which shul, the Beth Jacob? I was a member of all of them. I had to be, I had the chicken roast. <laughs> Every one of them. I'm still a member of the, of the Addis Israel, not at the temple. Really? So, I'm trying to figure, who was the rabbi? I mean, I was going to ask you. Rabbi Burke was the rabbi then. Oh, rabbi yes. Simon of the Beth Jacob Synagogue, Rabbi Baskin was <coughs> there, and then I don't remember those. But before the Neatus Israel, there was old rabbis there. I don't remember the names. I don't remember the names. Well, when did when did uh, Silverman Silverman must have so, showed up later? Silver came in about twenty years 67. ago. Yes, yeah, sixty-seven. I liked Rabbi Silverman. You know, I liked him. A lot of people didn't. But you know, be a rabbi who does, who going. <laughs> I remember one day when I was in Aberdeen Avenue going out of uh, the shul uh, from, the, from the Yom Kippur. So one guy says, I didn't like his speech. I looked at him and I said, how many times did you come to shul? Oh, once a year. I says, what about the other speeches? <laughs> That's like a speech. <laughs> you don't like a speech. Huh? You don't like a speech. But that rabbi is a hard thing to be. You know that. I mean. But I like all rabbis. All rabbis were good. Simon was a tough guy. Do you remember Simon? He was tough, but it was very, very good. I believe that a shul should be used for kids running around and all that. Not, not like a crazy man, but Rabbi Simon wouldn't, wouldn't let you in if he... A shul, I think, should be a shul like the old country. Yeah. Feel good about it. Let kids in. Let them come in. If you don't let the kids come in, who's going to come in? You're getting older. You Nancy, better get them interested. You forgot Rabbi Wiener. Oh, Rabbi Wiener. Nice Rabbi. man. Rabbi Wiener was a very fine man. I don't know why... I liked him. A lot of people liked him, and then he went to Israel, and then he died, I, I understand. But he was a nice man. His wife, too. But he took the teenagers to Israel by boat, and that was a big deal in those days. Uh, absolutely right. Yeah. And I gave money towards that. Sobel was involved in there, I think, in those years. He was a nice man. Do you agree with that? Yeah, Michael Sue was on that trip. Yeah. Were any of your kids on that trip? I did not let him go. Like a, I gave money, but I never let Cynthia go like a real schmo. Why not? Because I was stupid. Why were you, were you afraid? I know I wasn't afraid. I didn't know any better. I don't know why. I don't I had the money and everything. I just didn't. And still this day, my wife tells me, "You never let her go." I says, "Why didn't I, Sam? I was I was plain ignorant and stupid. Not ignorant. I was stupid. Why would not? You know, Israel. In fact, we're taking now 19 people. I was there three times. I'm taking all my family right now. J J August the 17th, all the grandchildren, the kids from a year up, and I'm taking them all. Let them get a little culture. Let them know what it's oh, all about. This August yeah, 17th. with 19 people. Is private bus, that? private this, everything. And I'm taking them all. Let them see the culture. Let them see what Israel looks like. Let them get the, the feel of the earth. Very nice. Well, it's good for them, I hope. And sure I'm just taking them for that reason. I took them once to Jamaica, throwing out money in the garbage. I just wouldn't do it. Israel is a beautiful trip for them. That's great. It's got to be, you got to introduce the Jewish kids to Israel. If you haven't got Israel, what have you got? What have you really got? Nothing. Zero. That's right. You've got to have security. That's my security. So, when, when, when we started, you were talking about Wendy's grandfather, who was a real pillar of, of, of the Jewish community, right? He was a saint. He was in the Jewish community center. He helped everybody. This yeah. man was a saint at a well, Talk a little bit about it, not because Wendy's here, no, no. but because, I mean, I, I presume that he really was a key, key person who had a heart of gold and so on. His contribution has to be acknowledged. I hope it was, I hope it is, and I hope they'll never forget him. But the young kids don't even know Frank Goldberg or George. The whole Goldberg family, like Marvin is the same as him. Marvin's got the same shtick, but he's loud. But, but, how can you, the family, they were the pillar post of Hamilton. Anybody could walk in their office and he'll return a call. Not only with money, with, with the brains, with knowledge. Uh, give the people a break. People that work for him, take a look. Marvin Rosenshine. Uh, gave him a yard in Guelph, Ma Marvin. I mean, who, who does that? They, they helped out people like, like crazy stupid. Mind you, Marvin let go a lot of good people. He should have never let go, but that's business. That's, that's decision making. But the, the Goldberg family, they, they, everybody was surrounded with the Goldberg family. They were, they were, they were... Without them, a lot of things would not happen. Let me just say this to you. Right. But there were other people too, by right? you. A lot of good people, not as good as them. They were the same. Goldberg was the same. Well, who were some other people that you remember? Who, who you know, may not have... Ken Sobel was a good man. 
He was for the people, he's for Hamilton. Talk about Ken Sobel. Ken Sobel, let me tell you about Ken Sobel. I started Ken Sobel early, early in life. And I did his daughter's wedding. He owned all kinds of property, right? I don't know about property, but he when owned Senator that. Senator Holmes across, on Governor's Road, he owned he, the whole... He owned, let me just say, he had, I, had, I did all the catering for them. Thank you for reminding me. Governor's Road, I went up to, he had lunch with the bank manager. He owned all of Governor's Road. Who did? It's Ken Sobel. He had a farm, he had a farm and horses, stables and all that. He says, Max, buy the place across the street. Farms, you know. I looked at her and said, what should I buy? I mean, what do I know about land? He says, I'm telling you to buy. And just wait, you're a young man, wait. I never did. He bought the whole, he, uh, he bought the whole, the, the whole area, he begged me to buy it. Now, let me just tell you about Sobel, Ken Sobel. Please. I opened up the chicken roost and I couldn't get a license. Those years, a lot of them to too, you know. Getting a license, you're Jewish, not Jewish, anyhow. So I went to Eddie Goodman. Eddie Goodman was his friend. Eddie Goodman was a fine gentleman, he still lives. So I went up to Ken Sobel. I said, look, Ken, I don't know why I can't get a, a license. I'm ready for it. That the, the, he called up to Ottawa. He knew people. He says, there's a problem with Max Mintz about a license that he should get. Why doesn't he get it? I got my license. Liquor license. Ken he Sobel. Who? Ottawa? Ottawa, a certain guy. St. Laurent. Was there St. Laurent in, in business then? It was a minister. Who? Saint Laurent, Laurent I think. Louis yeah. Saint Laurent. Well, he was Saint Laurent. Minister at one point, but. Yeah, yeah, he knew him. Oh, no, no, those days they had no computers to check and all. You know, I got my license. Really? Well, where was Ken Sobel from? Was he born in? He Britain? was born in Toronto, I believe. He lives on Lippincott Street in Toronto. I used to live. We asked the Brunswick and here, and he bought the CHML. That's I don't know too much about that, but he was very clever. But he helped people. He was there for a lot of good people. He could, he never. He never showed off. He drove it. He had a big car. Once he only used it for weekends. Only one of those Rolls Royces. He was a nice man. Too bad he died. He was too young. If not, this place would have gone. Israel would have gone much further with a guy like him. What do you mean? He knew people. They respected him. And when he made a phone call, they returned his call. When now Marvin that? Goldblatt is big. He doesn't use his. He doesn't use the full capacity. He does not use his full capacity. He does, well, he's shy, he doesn't want to bother. Like, I said, let's go to dinner out with these people. No, I don't want to go. He's got a, he's got a set pattern. And I love him for it. He, he goes to tennis, 3.30, God forbid you missed the red light at 3.35. Why didn't you make the red light? He could, he could harp on it for an hour. Then he goes, has di lunch, di dinner at 6.30, quarter to seven, he's ready. 7.30, he's got to go. The bar's got to clean up in this house. The, the house has got to be clean. I don't know, the house is so worn out from cleaning that it's cleaner than him. But that's his pattern. Maxie, what year did Ken Sobel die? Oh, gee, he was 42 years old. How did really? he die? A heart attack, I believe it was, years ago, at least. Before, my, but my brother was at least 40 years or more. He was a great guy. He Too was 42? I think he's about 42 years and old. And did he have children? Oh yeah, he's four daughters. Where are they now? All scattered in Toronto, one lives in California. He had four beautiful daughters. They did all their weddings. So there were no, no descendants? The, the, the mother, the, the Ken Sobel's wife is still living in Toronto. Francis Sobel is right. Francis Sobel. What was the biggest Jewish affair you did here? <clears throat> Do you remember? Well, Something I did the negative dinner for years and years and years. That? I did the Negev dinner for years, years, oh, yeah. and years, over 40 years. At weddings, 200 people, Ken Sobel's, different weddings. The biggest thing I ever did was for Lava's Grocery, 3,000 people in Toronto, horse in the park. We brought in stoves and ovens and kitchens and everything. That was the biggest one I did. I did the biggest one in Hamilton was 3,000 people, Jackson Square, the opening of Jackson Square for the, for the boys in, in Montreal. That was the biggest opening, 3,000. The bigger, the easier. The, high, the smaller, the harder. <laughs> you could hire help, you could do things, you can, you know. Michelle boys, Michelle brothers, in Jackson Square. That was the biggest one I did. But we did small ones, big ones. We did some interesting stuff. We, uh, we did all the, all the presidents, uh, we helped all the presidents, like uh, uh, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., you know. Uh, they, were all, they were all there. Ford, we did Ford with kosher kitchens right in the, in the you did Ford, what, Ford came to <coughs> Yeah, Ford was here for B'nai B'rith. Oh, I see. And we did his <coughs> dinner because it was kosher. And uh, we did uh, Thatcher. We helped for Thatcher's dinner. 
and pr at present Bush was here, we helped there. They, they needed us just to put the final little touches there, you know. Hmm. The table runs to the floor and all that stuff that goes with it. So we did some nice work, we did some bad work. But one thing I'll tell you, Morning Gold with Cosme. That Morning Gold was... Another brother. Another brother. So he calls me and he said, I want you to do a wedding. He has no money, but he do a wedding. I said, sure, no problem. So he comes down and I knew him. He, nice man, but poor. It doesn't matter what he's poor. If I have respect, that's fine. He was in the camera business. So he comes in and I says, well, you have a wedding of 150 people. We'll do a nice chicken dinner. Beautiful, I'll do it right for you. I won't let you down. I won't let, I won't let the Goldberg's family down. I won't let myself down. Oh no, he says, I want filet, I want, I want lace cloths, I want champagne. I looked at him, I says, well, who's going to pay for this? He says, don't worry about it. So I call him Morley, I says, Morley, talk to this man. This man is ordering a uh, rich man's dinner, which is not even nice for him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Anyhow, I did the dinner nicely, not what he wanted, but I did it nicely. And uh, I says, well, if you had the pie, you gave me a hundred dollar deposit. The wedding came to twelve hundred and fifty dollars those years. Twelve fifty was big money. You're talking about thirty five, forty years ago. And the rest you will collect. This is fine. You're this Jewish man. What can I do? So I did the wedding, and of course I didn't get paid. <laughs> so I called him once. He said, "I'll pay you. I'll come down and give me another hundred. I said, "Whatever you want. Don't give me a hundred. Give me fifty. Take your time paying." Anyhow, he had a camera shop. I, so I never paid for about four months. I went down to camera shop, it closed up. So what am I going to do? So I wrote it off. But the nicest thing was, the worst thing was, I went to the farmer's market, and um, no, a, a, a flea market, and her, her, the daughter, the daughter of, the, of the father, he died, and she had a baby. So I walked over, and I wanted to see my, my investment, my baby. <laughs> she ran away with the baby. I said, just a minute, don't run away. I got an investment in that baby. That baby owes me $1,100. One minute, please, let me look at the baby. She ran away, I never saw the baby. <laughs> That's good. Why, Rabbi Green told me to do a Russian wedding. He said, I want you to do three. You know, I respect Rabbi Green. I love him, I think the guy's great. I said, Rabbi, how many people? Anyhow, we did a wedding, no money. But that was, I knew before, that was great. I, I, I love Jewish people to help out, especially a poor person, why not? I, I was poor and I know what it's like to be poor. If I can help somebody out legitimately, I don't believe in cults. I don't believe in a period. I believe in giving direct, I'll give you direct. Now the guy at the center, you got with the couple there? No, is that his name? The guy that, for J and F, who works at the, at, at the center. Jerry Fisher? No, the guy. Hey, the guy that runs the center. Not, not Joy, but the community center. The guy sits in the back Jerry. office. Jerry. Jerry, your father runs, your father always talks to him. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I like people. The guy never says hello to me. The guy, oh, yeah. just a minute, not only that alone. He calls me, he says, I want to see you. I said, sure. I wait outside 10, 15 minutes, 20, and doesn't come out. You know, so I walk home. Next time he says, well, see me. I said, look, you can't see me. You, see, you made me wait 20 minutes here. Anyhow, the guy hasn't got a brain one for my money. It speaks to me. That's fine. I like. Finally speaks to me. He says, I, you're giving JNF so much money. He says, yes, I like it more. I says, well, what are you talking about? He says, I only want $67 more. You know? I mean, what business? He's, he shouldn't be there. He talks to me for $67, you know. Schmuck, talk to me, for, you know, for some rich, serious money. So, so, you know, I have nothing to do with him. He's a nice man, God bless him. I, I don't think he'll be working there. In my opinion, am I stupid in saying that or wrong? Let's move on. Okay, good. Okay, good. what else? No, you're very, very uh, wonderful to listen to. You well, so I've, uh, stories well and the truth is the true stories. I, listen, I, 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 I like PR work. Yeah. So uh, some customers, whenever they, they had a baby, I made sure I sent up meals to the hospitals and all that. And right. that time, she was a good customer. So what I did, I sent up my waitresses, a formal dinner, and a violin. Really? And we played at the, at the, at the St. Joseph's Hospital. For who? For a person that had a baby, she was a customer at the Chicken Roost. I don't remember the name, anyhow. That was the biggest thing I had, I was written up in the paper. Where can you get that? A violin and, and uh, you know, and I said, and the many people didn't have money, we picked up their checks, but that's normal, I mean, that's... Maxie, can you talk about the days when you were involved in theater with the Beth Jacob Theater Group? 
Oh, God, Muriel Beck. She was the greatest girl in the world. Talk about Muriel and her theater shows. Muriel Beck, Muriel Beck, in my opinion, was very, very bright. Tell Billy about Muriel. Who was she? Where did she come from? And what was the impact she had on this community? She comes from California. Her brother was Peter, very wealthy man. He did well. And Muriel could do anything she wants, just like this. She was, she, her brother was in the army and he needed somebody to run in four stores, optical stores. She picked it up like this and she ran the stores. Very bright. What brought her to Hamilton? Harold Beck. She fell in love with Harold Beck. Harold Beck went to New York and she was coming here and she did some plays. I got all her plays upstairs with the Tell words. Tell about these plays. These plays were unbelievable. She made up plays that I have words. You want to hear some of the words? Later, but Later. Tell Billy, what did she do? She took famous Broadway songs and right. wrote, rewrote the lyrics. Rewrote the lyrics, like my, uh, uh, everything that she had a song, Frank Sinatra, she wrote all about the lyrics, and the lyrics were hysterical and smart. The words that she, like one of the songs she says, we, we had to make, we had to raise money for the Pacheco. So one of the songs that I sang for, and I don't remember all the words, she came out with a song, Oh, vinu vinile shu. Oh, vinu vinile shu. The butcher, the baker, the cake maker. Oh, they are vinile shu. It's not enough to give. That I, I mean, she made up words that were just unbelievable. And then she made up a, a, a song, me work in the kitchen when the rabbi comes in and he finds that, uh, you know, I mean, she was very bright. Who would come to these plays? First of all, who would be in the plays and who would come to these plays? Lillian Goldworth was in it. My wife was in it. Dolly Goldworth was in it. She picked people out that, that brought people to the shul. That was her strength. And, she was, and I just can't say enough for her. Uh, and these were like fundraisers? Oh, fund, all were fundraisers. So it was all, all about fundraisers. All fundraisers. I just want to tell you, you see that Bet Jacob Synagogue, all the aluminum windows? Yeah. And the rails? Harold Beck gave it to them, no charge. He was in the loaner business. No charge. He says, you don't charge the shoe. But she was a great, she was a brain. She was a good looking girl, wasn't she? She was vivacious. When she walked, you looked at her, you know. She had, she had answered, and she was very cultured. You know, she was a little bit of art. She, she was a very well read girl. And Muriel and your wife, Sabbath, were the best of friends. Like this. And they were both New Yorkers, oh. and so here were these New York women, very sophisticated, they came to Hamilton, and did they stick out like a sore thumb? Like a sore thumb. Because they were so... Yeah, they were open. You know, they weren't school teachers. You know a school teacher? Oh, my skirt is not too high. Put it down. But they were, oh, you know, they were walking. They, they, they knew the score. They went into business together. They did very, very well. What kind of business was it? A little, uh, uh, makeup business. They did very well, but it was a fun game for them. If they were taking it serious, they could have been a trenches right through. And I'll never forget one day, they had stock over, they were funny people. They had stock and uh, they had makeup, green, uh, lots of green. So my wife is true. She said, you know, that green doesn't look good on you. You understand Jewish? Yes. She said, that green doesn't look good on you, madam. So she merely drops a, a, a lipstick on the floor and she said, pick it up. So she did. And she's forgotten that the green was cast in the sarkina over. That's not making it So forgot the green was the chief will do. Was cast in. Was it? Sagoy, Hobbin and Andrea. So you were in these plays at the Beth Chamber? Yeah, some of them, yes. Because you have a beautiful voice, man. Well, I have a beautiful voice. And also, uh, Amy Beck is going to have another play for the Bet Jacob now. Amy's smart, too, by the way. But Muriel's daughter, Amy, is back in Hamilton after many years away, and now she wants to resurrect this whole tradition of putting on these big plays. Yeah, yeah. And a lot, the lyrics were so clever because they, they were about the local situation, but she was so good with it that it was just so clever. Very clear. In fact, if you want to hear a few, I got them up, so I saved a few songs if you want. I don't know if you got time. Yeah, do you have, can yeah, you find them? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I got them up, so they're very clever. This was a razor I gained for the thing, and the song was something like this, I hope I remember it. Like the thump, thump, thump of my heartbeat when this job I undertook. Like the peak, peak, peak of the mishkiach in the kitchen when I cook. Like a cry, cry for the rabbi that I must go by the book. So a voice inside me keeps me repeating, schnook, 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 night and day I am the one 
Only I know how to make the party more fun. And no matter what you spent, rest assured I haven't made a cent. I'm, I swear to you. <laughs> night and day, day and night, I, I'm at your call. Only I know how to make your simcha a ball. I serve a different menu every week. I promise you eat my meal and you will feel under the height of you. There's been such a heartburn burning churning inside of you and this termate won't be through till you pay your bills so I don't have to sue night and day, day and night. <laughs> I hope I sang it right. That's all about you. Just a minute. I don't know. Oh no, the other song goes like this. And that was the raise of the money. Oy vey, how we ve need a shoe. Oy vey, we needed a shoe. Together, together, in all kinds of weather. Oy vey, how we need a shoe. It's not enough to care. Donate what you think is fair. The butcher, the caker, the poo undertaker. Oy vey, have to give our share. Or they we needed a shoe, or they we needed a shoe to worship together no matter the weather, or they have we needed a shoe. This is for the Addis? This is for Bajiga. Oh, Bajiga. Always the Bajiga. Okay. Now, this, uh, this was a song written for my Sharon when she wanted to go to school, and I think it goes something like this. <clears throat> My friends, I tell you this, another miss would be discouraged. But she applied again, you have to say, she had the courage. So then they told her yes, but they did her such a favor, waking up at 4 a.m., changed her behavior. She went to his doctors, my sheriff. Just, that's right. So regrets. She had a few, at times of days, was sheer frustration, but yet she made it through. I can cry for that. Because the words are about it. She made it through, and we are at her graduation. At times, the pressure built around her like a deadly menace, but she, she found relief in squash and tennis. Yes, there were times, I sure she knew, when she bit off more than she could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, she ate it up and spit it out. She faced all the way, she stood it tall and did it her way. That was my Sharon. Muriel wrote that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt a song was due to celebrate this great occasion. An ode to Sharon Mintz, her privacy is it's an invasion. She worked hard for women's rights, and now then she did a survey, studied hard with all her might, and did it her way. She went to U of T, and she came out with a diploma, but she didn't know a headache from a carcinoma. But then she worked with kids, and after that applied to Mumsy, but no, it left her with pains and thumbsy. She went to school for social work, but she was cool, she didn't shirk. She shared a house with girls and cats, looked after tenants with their breads. The record shows she took the blows and did her way. I, I'm sorry, I cried, but things come back to me, you know. <laughs> she went to school and it was very hard those days, you know, and, uh, yeah. but there was many songs upstairs that uh, she had a brain. The girl had such a brain. She was, but all around the people and all around what they, you know. But uh, what can I say about her? I can only, she, met, she was a wonderful friend. And Harold Beck was the same way. Harold Beck could fix a light. He could fix, Harold Beck got like, sick. He was a very big operator. Big, big, big. In fact, he was the owner of the cable business, you know. He was the original owner of Russell Cable. And uh, they were up north. And this man came to Harold. He says, look, I got a cable for sale. I, you know, you can have the out Westdale. He says, what on other cables? So Phil Rosenblatt was there. Cecil Levy was there, Stark was there, and him. So they all got together about the cable. But Cecil Levy was the smartest one of them all. They were all busy in their own businesses. They didn't know about the cable, how big, small, or different. Cecil, Cecil Levy went to Ottawa, learned all about the cable. He thought it was big. So he went to them and said, look, you don't need it. 
my, my Lauren, I believe, is coming out of school as an engineer. I want him to come in with me. Will you sell? He says, yeah, we'll sell it. They gave him $100,000 for the cable business. And the rest is history.